want to do when I give the word, I would like you all to say the Lord's Prayer in your own language. Marafiki Zangu, Ningipenda, Kuradia, Sala Yabwana, Pamoja, Wakati, Ninasima. Okay. Mes amis, je voudrais que vous répétiez la prière du Seigneur ensemble quand je dis « OK ». Everybody understand? OK. Our Father, who is in heaven, all together, please, say it out loud. Asante. Merci. Thank you. Today's reading is from Luke 11, verses 1 to 13. But there are also going to be excerpts from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 6. Starts off. One day, when Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Father, I just ask that you take control of this meeting right now. That you move amongst your people gathered here. so that each one will hear what they need to know, that they might disregard the way I speak and the way I present it, but that they just hear your voice and your word, because I ask it in your name. Amen. Then Jesus went on to say, suppose one of you has a friend and he he goes to him at midnight and he says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though, you will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend. Yet because of the man's shamelessness or boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks the door will be opened. 
Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I guess one of the problems with the Lord's Prayer for Christians, there's obviously nothing wrong with the Lord's Prayer, but for Christians, it's not the content, but it's misunderstanding and possible misuse. In Matthew's account, taken from the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer is preceded by a caution from Jesus in Matthew 6, verse 7. He says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans or heap up fancy phrases, for they think they'll be heard because of the many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is how you should pray. And he goes on to give the prayer that we, we know so well, or maybe not so well. We think we know it because it's short and succinct. As we've illustrated, most of us can repeat the prayer whilst probably thinking of something else without any connection. A bit like trying to do your tax accounts and at the same time cocking your ear to the listen to the radio, the World Cup final. You can say the Lord's Prayer. It means nothing. You can race through it as fast as you can. I always remember having to do lines at school. I don't know if anybody else ever got lines to do at school. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. 100 lines. I must write more slowly. So you'd start off when the teacher was watching very slowly. And as soon as they turned the back, you'd have a system. I, 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 I. What's must be? All that sort of thing. We can't go through the Lord's Prayer like that. We can't just rhyme it off and say it. It's meaningless. This prayer shows the goodness of God if we approach him as a child, approaches a loving father. Now this prayer we read in Luke, Luke 11, is similar to, but not quite the same, with that found in Matthew, <coughs> where our Lord was preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Here, Luke says, uh, Jesus starts off by saying, when you pray, say, strongly suggesting that the actual words should be repeated. But if that is so, if this is a prayer that we should pray, then we need to understand the meaning of what we're actually saying. What is your picture of God? Do you have a picture of God in your mind when you pray? Who are we addressing here? A man? Some unknown being a long way away, far away in the sky? Is he personal to you? Or is he distant? When Jesus begins, our Father, he's being very inclusive. No matter your background, your upbringing, your education, the color of your skin, your, your language, or even your accent. In this prayer, we are addressing our Father in heaven. You might remember in another prayer when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's recorded in Mark's Gospel, Mark 14. And he begins his prayer, Abba, Father. Now in Aramaic, the word for Father is Abba. But the Aramaic-speaking Jew would have said his prayers in Hebrew. 
and Jewish people would probably find it impious or disrespectful to address God in such a familiar fashion. Yet even though the gospel writers were using the Greek language to write their gospels, they thought it important to retain the word uh, Abba, the Aramaic Abba. And then because they were writing in Greek, they inserted the Greek words Hopeta for father. So in Greek it would be Abba, Hopeta, Abba, father. The preservation of the Aramaic word was likely because Jesus himself used the word in his prayers. Abba is a respectful address to a superior as well as displaying a profound personal relationship between the one addressed and the person who uses the word. Now I understand not everyone has or has had a positive relationship with their earthly father. But here, we're not addressing a fallible human being. We are addressing the supreme being who created billions of stars, flung them out into space. If ever you were at night and you look up and you just see a tiny fraction of what, what is there to be seen. Yet the God who did that, he has a care for every individual who has lived or is living or will live on our little blue planet. So why does he care for us? Well, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 2, we are a chosen people belonging to God. If you are following Jesus, you are chosen. You are a child of God. The prayer continues, hallowed be your name. Well, as he is the author of creation, let's, let's begin with his name. God is Elohim, and his name is Yahweh. If it wasn't there, might reappear. Um, we know it as Yahweh. That's how we pronounce it. But the letters in the Hebrew are quite different to the letters we know, Y-H-W-H. And of course, the Hebrew is spelled from right to left. And um, the letters we are interested in are the, the second and fourth letters. These letters represent the Spirit of God. In Exodus 17, we remember God renamed Abram. And God took one, it's not even a letter really, it's a it's more of a sound from the middle of God's name. It's a <sighs> sound. And he placed it in the middle of Abraham's name. And he did the same with Sarai. He put a <sighs> at the end of Sarai. So Abraham, Abraham became Abraham. And Sarai became Sarah became Sarai. We remember in the Garden of Eden, God breathed the breath of life into Adam and Eve. <sighs> Every breath we take is a homage to God. We've already sung this morning, it's been prayed this morning. Every breath we take is a homage to God. God's name is the holiest of names. It is to be regarded in the highest respect. Even today, strict Jews will not speak the name of God. It 
if you remember, God revealed his name to Moses in, in Exodus chapter 3, verses 13. When Moses was complaining to God, I'm having to go back to the Israelites. Who shall I say sent me? And God said, I am that I am. I am has sent me. It's written as four Hebrew consonants <coughs> called the Tetragrammaton, meaning consisting of four letters. But because of the lack of vowels, Bible scholars today still debate how it should be pronounced. We pronounce it Yahweh. Maybe right. After the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BC, Jews ceased to speak the name of Yahweh and started to use Elohim, meaning God, or Adonai, meaning Lord, because the divine name was increasingly regarded as too sacred to be uttered. And it was replaced locally in the synagogue services by the Hebrew word Adonai. Exodus 20 and verse 7 tells us, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. He's told us not to take his name in vain. Now we know in a secular world the name of the Lord is abused daily. Countless times, television, radio, newspapers, entertainment, films, walking down the street, we hear the name of our Lord as a curse, a swear word, And even to some people, what seem a, a light-hearted almost and inoffensive expression, oh my God, is in my opinion a misuse of his name. Isn't God the author and giver of life? If you imagine a table laden with your favorite food, <clears throat> in my case, custard vanillas, or any cake with royal icing, in Bruce's case, it's ice creams. You can talk about the colors and the textures and which one you'd like to save to last. But until you actually take one, lift it to your lips, take a bite, you will never taste the food or experience the pleasurable sensation of what it's like. We can read about God. We can talk about God. You can listen to other people's experiences they have with God. You can discuss all his attributes, all the wonderful things you've read and hear about him. But if that's your knowledge of God, knowing about him, then I have to say, you don't know him. You do not know him. To experience God is a wonderful experience. And you can only do that one-to-one. -one. You cannot experience God through anyone else. Only you can know him intimately for yourself. And the more you know him, the less you will want to disappoint him. It goes on to say, your kingdom come. What is God's kingdom? Where is God's kingdom? Will we ever get to see God's kingdom?
Matthew refers to the kingdom of heaven. Mark and Luke to the kingdom of God. And these descriptions are more or less interchangeable. They both mean the same place. And it's probable that the kingdom of heaven used in Matthew's gospel so that God's name is not misused. So it tells us in Matthew 6, verse 10, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So have we got to travel the world? Take a world cruise looking for this mysterious kingdom? Or can we find us a little closer to home? In Mark 12, verse 34, <clears throat> let's start in 28, it says, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And of course, Jesus went on to say about loving the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and loving your neighbor as yourself. And the man replied, well said, teacher. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him and to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. In Matthew 3, when uh, John the Baptist started his ministry, his first recorded words were, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. And in Luke 17, Twenty-one. Twenty, twenty, once. Once having been asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation. Nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is. Because the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is characterized by righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14. In my opinion, and I'm sure it'll be debated, heaven is not so much a physical place, it's a state of being. And to me, heaven is the presence of God wherever we happen to be. Matthew's Gospel continues, your will be done. Now we know everyone has free will. You can please yourself what you do, where you go. You can choose to live any way you want. So does the thought of doing God's will hold you back? Would you not rather be doing your own thing making your own plans? Does the choice of what you want to do not seem more satisfying than God's will? Well, if you're following Jesus, your life shouldn't be boring. It shouldn't be dull. It shouldn't be squalid or lifeless. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for everyone who submit to him. A life full of interest, direction, joy. Always remembering his ways are higher than yours and his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Too often we choose to go our own way, to do our own thing to behave the way we want to behave. Like when we choose to criticize someone. 
when we make a remark about appearance or you hear some gossip about someone else. Tell me more. Even when the criticism is unintentional, I said lightheartedly, it can hurt. Doesn't the Bible tell us to build one another up? To encourage? To think of others as better than yourselves? <coughs> There's a song with these words. Before you accuse, criticize, and abuse, walk a mile in my shoes. How can we look at someone's appearance or judge their attitude and think we have the right to correct them or shun them or pull them to pieces when we don't know what has happened to in their lives? Is it not better to draw alongside them and encourage them, maybe even putting yourself out to do that? Isn't that what Jesus did? Draw alongside outsiders, those who were considered on the edge of society. You will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But you scientists here will know that the earth is composed of many elements and also people. We, us, we are, we are made of some of the same elements that the earth is made of. There are over 45 elements in the earth which are also in the human body. Some of them are iron, zirconium, lead, tin, gold, and silver. That's why I married Irene, but I've not come across it yet there. But didn't God make mankind from the dust of the earth and then breathe the breath of life into their lungs? So when we speak of earth, we can speak of ourselves as well. We're all lumps of earth in this building this morning. We did a first aid course at Trust House a few weeks ago and we had to give the kiss of life to a lifeless dummy. And it was the most weird thing I've ever done. It was actually only a torso with a head. We had to sort of pinch the nose over the mouth and breathe as hard as we could into this dummy. <sighs> and it was so weird because the chest rose when you did it. <laughs> then went back again. Well, that's what God has done with us. We have the breath of life in our bodies. Though unfortunately, with Adam and Eve, he had to chastise them for their disregard of his command not to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. And they use those words that we quite often use at funerals. From dust you came, and to dust you shall return. Give us this day our daily bread. Some versions say this day, some say each day. But what is our daily bread? Because we're the children of a loving and gracious Father, we, we can expect that he will supply all our needy. He tells us in Philippians 4.19, My God will supply all your need according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So can we sit back? Put our feet up. Expect the Lord to arrange a daily supply of bread from Warburton's. And how much is enough? And how much is too much? How do we know? If you remember, the Lord supplied the Israelites on the Exodus with daily manna, bread from heaven. But if they collected too much and tried to save some for the next day, because they didn't trust him, it went bad, and they had to throw it away. 
the Lord will supply us with what we need, and not necessarily what we want. And of course, bread. Bread here, it's not just food. It's also a synonym for money. We all need money, don't we? But people think of their job, or an investment, or savings, or their own business as their supply. And they panic if something happens. What's going to happen? How can we manage? Well, let me tell you, God is the supplier. God is the supplier. Jobs, etc., are the channels through which God sends the supply. But God is the supplier. And he also gives us abilities and skills which enable us to earn bread and earn a living. But at the top, God is the supplier. And depending on the translation you have, forgive us our trespasses, our debts, our sins. So whichever word it is, the, the word trespass is, uh, in Greek is paraptoma. And that can be translated a lapse or a deviation, a fault, offence, sin, trespass. If it says sin, that's Greek hamatano, which is similar, can miss the mark, offend or trespass. Or the Hebrew word koto means to miss or to sin, or to trespass. Forgive us our trespasses, debts, sins. If we did not sin, or deviate, or cause offence after we got saved, Jesus would not have told us to ask forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins is a central problem in life. If we sin, we know we've separated ourselves from God. If you were to ask God to bless something you know is wrong, we can safely rely on the fact that he will not bless it. Of course, you can still go ahead and do it, but be it on your own head. We know we trespass when we've thought a wrong thought, spoken an unjustified, critical word, or performed an act that we know is distasteful to God exaggerated even the truth to make it so more exciting or frightening. Or it might make us just seem more perfect than we are. In other words, a lie. And then he qualifies, qualifies it by adding, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Oof as we forgive those who trespass against us. In Matthew 6, 14, it continues at the end of, of the prayer. If you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you. That's pretty serious to me. Have you ever gone through the names of people who have offended you? Have you forgiven them? No. Well, do it now while you still have time. None of us know how long we have. Forgive is essential. Have you ever realized our relationship with God is very closely tied into our relationship with people? with work colleagues, family here at MCC, our neighbour. Jesus said, love your neighbour as yourself. You know that God has forgiven you, and we have to forgive. I was going to say even when we don't feel like it, but I will say especially when we don't feel like it, we still forgive. Lead us not into temptation. 
Surely God won't lead us into temptation. Surely that's not his nature. How can he? When he's holy and pure. Well, in James 1, 13, he says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, neither does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he's dragged away and enticed and gives in to sin. The trouble with temptation is that if we do give in to it, we often try to conceal it. We often try and disguise it so that it looks innocent. And of course, the other problem with temptation is that as we deepen our relationship with God, it may empower us with spiritual gifts, with wisdom and knowledge, gifts of healing, a prophetic ministry, and we might start to believe we've earned those gifts or deserve them. We may try to use them for our own gratification. They are a gift and can be removed just as quickly as they are given. If God was to answer every prayer with, yes, of course, you can have what you want, is there not a danger that eventually we start asking for things simply to satisfy our own agendas, our own desires. Our understanding of our needs is often shallow. Deliver us from evil. And we read, we've already read further on in Luke 11, verse 13, and Jesus describes us as being evil. Well, the Greek meaning for evil in this case means when we've done something bad, when we've grieved the Holy Spirit, when we've done something deliberately malicious. And the word deliver has the meaning of, of rescuing us or setting us free from the evil we get trapped in, but it's not prevention. We've got free will. God will not prevent us from doing anything evil. This delivers from evil is a, is a petition. It's a request for God's mercy to set us free when we have sinned. The Holy Spirit delivers us from the power of sin in our life. But the only way to avoid doing evil is by being obedient to God. And our greatest defense against falling into sin is the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives and our dependence upon him by the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. To illustrate that God can be trusted to respond to our prayers, Jesus tells us the parable of a man who calls on a friend at midnight. Now, hospitality was of paramount importance in biblical times. And when a guest arrived, even unexpected or at midnight, there was no question that hospitality had to be extended. So when the first man goes and finds himself without enough bread for his guest, he goes to a friend and knocks on his door and has to borrow some bread, even though that means waking up the whole household. And in those days, families slept in one room. Parents, children, sometimes even the animals slept in the same room. So the second man is thinking, everyone settle down. The children have gone off to sleep at last. The animals are quiet. I'll have to disturb everyone just to give him some bread. 
You might empathise with the woken up friend and think that the midnight caller is unreasonable, pushing the limits of friendship. But in the culture of the biblical world, it is the woken up friend who's behaving badly. The ability of his friend to provide hospitality and thus his honour is at stake. And Jesus says that the men will eventually respond to his friend's request, not because he is a friend, but because of his friend's shamelessness in persisting and insisting his sleepy friend help him. His friend displays no shame in asking for help to meet the requirements of hospitality. In fact, there would be it would be the woken up friend who would incur dishonour if he failed to help his neighbour in this essential obligation. So he will respond, not least because of social pressure. Jesus' parable implies that if it's like that amongst friends, with their mixed motives and selfish interests, How much more with God? How much more so with God? Who wants to give us what is good and life-giving? And who is invested in keeping his name holy? There is no shame in asking for help. Jesus continues, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search and you will find Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. This is perhaps the most difficult part of the passage to understand. Because often our experience contradicts Jesus' words. So often we ask, and we don't receive. We search, we haven't found. And in spite of our most fervent prayers for health and safety, we've lost loved ones to disease and illness and accidents. And in spite of the fervent prayers of people around the world, daily we hear of tragedies, of violence and hunger, disease and natural disaster. But remember, his ways are higher than your ways. And his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Most times we are connected impersonally through media with what is taking place around the world. God is connected personally. He is ministering to those who are abused and ill-treated and assaulted and even murdered. We must concentrate on our own personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. We call what we've been reading the Lord's Prayer. But I think a more apt description would probably be the disciples' prayer. I'd just like to close with um, reading a commentary by a, a man called Matthew Henry. And this is what he says. Christ encourages fervency and constancy in prayer. We must come for what we need as a man does to his neighbour or friend who is kind to him. We must come for bread, for that which is needful. If God does not answer our prayer speedily, he will in due time, if we continue to pray. Observe what to pray for. We must ask for the Holy Spirit, not only as necessary in order to our praying, but as all spiritual blessings are included in that one.
For by the influences of the Holy Spirit, we are brought to know God, to repent, to believe in, and to love Christ. And so are made comfortable in this world and meet for happiness in the next. All these blessings our Heavenly Father is more ready to bestow on everyone that asks for them than an indulgent parent is to give food to a hungry child. And this is the advantage of the prayer of faith, that it quiets and establishes the heart in God. So I'll just leave you with a question. For the followers of Jesus Christ, who love to talk about him, love to know about him, love to discuss him. And there are disciples of Jesus Christ who know him and are prepared to face the discipline of his instructions, hardships, rejections, and joys and delights. Which are you? Father, we bless your holy name. Your name is above all names. You are, I am that I am. You are everything we need. Everything we need you to be, Lord. And we fail you so often. But you don't discard us. You don't brush us to one side. You don't ignore us. Your arms are ever ready to receive us. So I pray, Holy Spirit, stay with us, Lord. Remind us. Constantly remind us of our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Fill us to overflowing. 